Hi, my name is Jimmy Manning. I am Professor and Chair of Communication Studies at the University of Nevada in Reno, and I would like to welcome you to Extending and Expanding Notions of Family in the Interpersonal and Family Communication Classroom. And as you probably know, this is a part of the NCA Speaker Series on Developing Ideas for Teaching and Research. And as you can see here, there are three other great sessions that you can attend from Scott Myers, Amy Clark, and Richard Craig. And so I'm in really good company here and I can't wait to see some of these sessions myself. And you can find them all at www.natcom.org. That's the National Communication Association website. All right, so this particular series of sessions that you're in is called Extending and Expanding Notions of Family in the Interpersonal and Family Communication Classroom. And this particular session that you're in is session number one, Defining and Theorizing Family Communication. And it's just the first of five sessions that you'll be able to attend as part of this series. Session two will look at identity and difference. Session three will look at thinking about normative and non-normative families. Session four will be about rethinking family communication. We'll particularly look at space, place, and metaphors. And then session five will be about critical interpersonal and family communication studies. And so getting back to session number one, we're gonna be talking about defining and theorizing family communication. And so the goal or, or the way that I have this set up is that we'll start with some things that are taught in most family communication classrooms or that are utilized by a lot of family communication teachers and researchers. And then as we get into the later sessions, we'll get into the newer material and the newer ideas that kind of expand the boundaries of family communication and help us to maybe think about what family communication can be uh, and where it's going. So for this particular session, I have three goals. And the first goal, I want to talk a little bit more about the speaker series. So I kind of gave you an overview of what I want to do with it. So I'll tell you a little more about what it entails and what you can expect from session to session as you go through those five sessions. Second, I want to examine definitions of family and family communication. And we're not going to really do that through like me philosophizing or talking about it. Rather, I'm going to review some readings that help me to think more about family communication and that can especially help students in a family communication classroom or in an interpersonal communication classroom uh, kind of grapple with this idea of how we define family and think about family. And then the third goal for this session is I want to give you an activity and assignment that is related to defining family. Uh, both of them are classroom tested and both of them have worked well. Uh, I'm not claiming to have created anything exciting here. And in fact, I'm sure that I didn't originate some of these activities. I'm sure other people have their own versions, uh, but they are very helpful. And so I want to share them here so we can kind of maybe compare notes. And so even if you don't want to use these or if you're already using a version of this, um, maybe just maybe you can be inspired um, to think about it in a different way. All right, so getting back to goal number one, what is this series of sessions about? And so this is kind of a series within a series. And of course, you know these sessions are gonna be about family communication. Um, and as I said, I really want us to think about how we can extend and expand notions of family. Um, and that's not just in the sense of what kinds of families are represented or who's represented in families, but even how we think about communication and family communication uh, when, we're, when we're looking at families in the classroom or when we're looking at families in our research. And so as I uh, wrote up as the description for this, these sessions examine how families are defined and represented in interpersonal and family communication classrooms, including a mix of classic and hot off the press readings, plus I'll note some readings that are still in press, and then also some classroom tested teaching activities. These sessions will consider how instructors can help students to expand their understanding of what a family is and how communication plays a vital role in that understanding. Importantly, the sessions will also focus on diversity and inclusion in family communication studies, especially in the sense of who is and who is not represented in family communication theory. And so I think that gives you a pretty good idea of where we're going. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about who I am. And so if we were actually in a, a room where we would be able to have these classes in person, one of the things that I would have us all do is introduce ourselves. And then because we're all professors, I would have us share our story of how we came to family communication. Uh, and so I hope you'll indulge me. I'm gonna share a little bit about my story about how I came to family communication. And so when I entered the master's program at the University of Kansas in 2001, I did not think that I was going to be a family communication scholar. Uh, in fact, I went there to study legal communication and organizational communication. Uh, but after I had my first couple of semesters of classes, 
I was hooked and I realized that I wanted to stay on and get my PhD. And I switched that focus to organizational communication and public communication. And then I had a classroom visit, so I wasn't taking her class, uh, but she came in to do a guest lecture. Uh, and this professor changed my life and made me think, yeah, this, this seems like some good stuff to study. And so Dr. Adrian Kunkel, who ended up being my advisor uh, for my dissertation project, um, she talked about social support. And a lot of her research dealt with social support and gender. And I thought, you know, I keep reading these studies of coming out. And when I read these studies of coming out, they're all about the psychology of coming out. They don't really look at the interaction and the interpersonal communication that's happening. And so I wanted to study that with her. How do people come out to other people? What does that entail? What does that look like? And so on and so forth. Um, but that still didn't begin my family communication story because although I was looking at families in some of that research, um, I really wasn't making that a focus or making that a priority. And then in 2006, I finished my PhD and I took my first job at Northern Kentucky University uh, with some of the best colleagues that I, I'll ever imagine I'll have. And uh, one of those colleagues was Andrea South. Uh, at the time, she was Andrea Lambert. And we had some really good conversations because we had to share an office when we first got there. They were building a new building. It's a whole story. Um, but one day, we were, we were having a conversation, and she said, you know what? You're a family communication scholar. You just don't know it yet. And I thought she was wrong, uh, but as I started teaching more interpersonal communication classes and integrating more of the family research and hearing her talk about the family research, uh, she changed my life a lot too. And so I eventually did a study on how families communicate about purity pledges. And after I did that, I was like, wow, there's a lot to this family stuff and I just wanna keep going. And so that's how I became a family communication scholar. Uh, before I knew it, I was teaching my own family communication courses and now I proudly identify as someone who is a family communication person. So Andrea South, you were right. All right, so uh, right now I got, you know, kind of the COVID hair going on, like uh, this is the best I can get it right now. And um, I, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm a guy who needs someone to help me with the beard. Uh, but if you saw me at a conference, I might look more like this. Uh, but for now you get COVID-19, Jimmy. Um, actually, if you were at a conference and it was toward the end of the conference, I might look more like this. Uh, I go hard at conferences. Um, anyway, uh, enough of the bad jokes. Let's get into the components of each session. So in this series, um, each session will have some kind of uniform format. And so when you come to one of these sessions, the first thing I'll do is review the goals for the session, including an overview of the topic and the materials included. That way you can decide, eh, is this for me or is this not for me? And so you'll get a sense of, of what's going to be there. You can always go out, go and check the readings out as well. And so those are posted with these videos. And so you should be able to get a sense of what readings I'll be talking about in each session as well. Plus there will be the activities and some videos. And so you'll have a pretty good sense, but I do wanna kind of introduce, this is what we're talking about and this is what we're gonna be looking at in this particular session. Then after I do that, I'll provide a select overview of the readings aligned with the session. And so uh, this, this series that NCA has put together uh, in some ways is replacing the NCA Institute for Faculty Development, which is sometimes called the HOPE Conference. Uh, and that's one of the best experiences I've ever had as a professor. It must be, I've gone 11 times. Um, but when you go to the, to the HOPE Conference or the, the Institute, uh, basically, it's like grad school for professors, and so one of the best parts of that is we get sets of readings and we read them and discuss them and, and talk about them and let them inspire us both for our research and for our teaching. Um, obviously, we can't have that interaction here, um, but one of the things that does happen at the NCA Institute is they will go through and say, okay, here are some things that you can really, the, the seminar leaders will say, here are some things that you can take away from this reading, and so as this leader, um, for, for these sessions, I will try to do that for you all. Then after I do that, I'll offer some course materials and specifically uh, for each session, I'll give you one assignment that is a paper assignment and then one activity that you can do in your classroom. And so that's how it's set up. Those are kind of the resources you get along with the commentary here. And then you'll notice there are also some links to videos that you can explore that align with each of the sessions. All right, and then after that, uh, the final part of each session is uh, me making note of any additional resources that might be helpful and that are related to the topic. 
um, and that are included as a part of the extending and expanding notions of family communication speaker series. And so um, basically that'll, that'll be just me reminding you that there are other m materials available as part of this. All right, the other thing I'm gonna try to do, so I'm, I'm filming all these sessions in order and I'm doing them day by day, but I'm going to try to make each of them only be 20 minutes. Uh, so you know that if you want to log in, log on, you want to you want to check out a session, you'll only have to be here for 20 minutes. Today I'm going to give myself a little longer because I'm introducing this series. Uh, but days two through five, uh, if I get past that 20 minute mark, I'll try to be as uh, quick as as possible, so I won't take up too much of your time uh, and can, can kind of keep you to that 20 minute limit. All right, so getting back to this session which is defining and theorizing family communication. Um, we're just gonna jump right into the first article. And uh, as I told you, goal number two for this session is to talk about the readings and unpack the readings. And we're starting with a very good reading. And so this uh, journal article is titled, Theory and Research from the Communication Field, Discourses that Constitute and Reflect Families. And it is from the journal, Journal of Family Theory and Review, which is a very prestigious journal in the interdisciplinary area of family studies. And so uh, this particular article, in a way, is introducing a lot of people who study families, but don't necessarily study family communication. And in fact, a lot of family scholars don't study family communication. Uh, but this article introduces people to what we do in the field of communication studies when it comes to family communication. Uh, and so the, the two authors that, that we have here, Dr. Kathleen Galvin and Dr. Don Braithwaite, are two excellent authors for this purpose. Uh, both are ambassadors for the discipline and, and represent us well, um, but they also have a rich history and a very different kind of history with family communication studies. So what I'll do for each of these articles and what I'll do for this one is I will highlight some of the important parts of the article that I think can be especially helpful in the classroom and kind of let you know what each article or chapter or reading does. And so in the case of this one, I actually have a lot of discussion points because this article, I cannot stress enough, is really a great way to introduce people who might not be familiar with family communication theory to family communication theory, or just what family communication is and what the studies entail. And so five features of the article that I think are particularly notable, starting with number one, the history of family communication. And so uh, Dr. Galvin has been there since the beginning um, as a founder of family communication studies. And then Don Braithwaite has been doing this for quite a while as well. Uh, both of them love family communication. They've authored textbooks in family communication. They've dealt with family communication theory. Uh, they've advised a lot of students on family communication studies. And so they have a rich sense of what's going on and how family communication came to be, and even how family communication came to this point. So if you go to that article, you're gonna find this brief history there to kind of let you know, this is how we got to where we are. Second, the article explains what it means to take on a family communication perspective. Uh, and so a family communication perspective, as they explain, is not simply the communication that happens within a family, uh, or some folks might call it the container model, but also the communication about families and the communication that constitutes families, right? And so they kind of, they kind of point out that this is a broader thing than just how do families interact, how do families communicate with each other, uh, taking on a family communication perspective means that you're looking at a lot of the richness and, and a lot of the deepness that comes out there with all the ways people talk about families and the way that families interact to create this sense of what a family is. Third, this article presents some of the most common family communication theories. And specifically, as you can see here, they look at communication accommodation theory, communication privacy management theory, family communication patterns, narrative theories, and relational dialectics theory. And so in my humble opinion, they nailed it. They found five theories that are used quite frequently by family communication scholars, and five theories that even if they didn't necessarily originate in family communication studies, have grown and developed along with family communication studies. Uh, and so I think these are five great theories. Of course, uh, there can be a critique for any time we present theories. And so the critique's not so much on what the authors did, again, I think that, that Galvin and Braithwaite have nailed it here with picking these five theories. Um, but the critique might be a larger critique that can be aimed at the field. 
and that is how inclusive are these theories and have these theories been developed with a variety of families or a variety of identities within those families? And so what kind of bodies and identities are we dealing with that have created these theories? And so if you are worried about that, the fourth feature of the article looks at discourse dependence and the construction of family identities. Now, I don't want to talk too much about discourse dependence here because that'll really come into play with session three of this series. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about that construction of family identities part because they do note that families are different and that some families need more explanation or more understanding because they're more unique or they're not what people would expect to see when they think of family. It doesn't mean they're not a family. It just means that, you know, maybe there's something there that, that is a little extra. <clears throat> and so multiple family identities are looked at in the article, including post-divorce and step families, adoptive families, multiracial and multi-ethnic families, and LGBTQ families. And then another bonus here is that for each of these four areas, in addition to defining these different family identities, they go over some of the research that is that is kind of put this re, that has kind of advanced this area of study for family communication, and so it makes for, as a great jumping off point for anybody who wants to study any of those four areas um, and having some resources that they can turn to. And then a fifth feature of this article, uh, and I'll move my head out of the way so you can see it, is that it looks at the current trends in family communication studies. So the article is not just a review or what we've done, they're also looking forward. Um, and again, I think they have nailed uh, the areas that they particularly look forward in. One of those areas is the communibiological research, uh, or uh, more specifically, the research where physiological elements are combined or, or put in conjunction with the social elements to get a sense of family. And so, uh, you know, Tammy Afifi is doing this great work where she's looking at resilience and looking at how bodies respond um, in addition to the communication that's there. And so they, they cover that kind of area and, and get us thinking about that. They also study critical interpersonal and family communication studies um, and talk a little bit about that as a future direction. And uh, that is something we will talk about in session five, so I won't say much there. <clears throat> but as I hope you can see, great article, there's a lot here. And even though I'm not listing it as a feature of the article, I will also point out that this article is highly readable. Graduate students have no problem with it. And then I've given it to juniors and seniors at the undergraduate level, uh, and they're able to read it and understand it. We might have to unpack some of the theoretical stuff or they don't quite understand the current trends part always. Um, but those are very doable things as a teacher, right? So to go in there and explain it and help them get through it. Uh, and so overall, I would say this is a great article at either the undergraduate or the graduate level to get your students into it. And then if you're newer to family communication uh, or, you know, you've just never come across this article, uh, I definitely recommend it as a must read. All right, moving along to a second article. This one is actually not an article. It's a chapter and it comes from a book called Casing the Family, Theoretical and Applied Approaches to Understanding Family Communication. That's edited by Sarah Simons LeBlanc. And so I think that, uh, Sarah recognized there was a need for this kind of tool in the classroom. And so just talking about this book a little bit, what the book does is uh, feature a series of case studies. And these case studies are often fictive, meaning that they give you a story that is often paired with a theory or a family concept. And so students can kind of see the theory in action and read the theory via these stories. And so the editor was for that is Sarah Simons LeBlanc. And then she also wrote something um, that is at the beginning of this book called The Third Day of Class. And what I think that this, uh, this reading uh, does is it allows um, many benefits that you can take into your classroom, especially as you're trying to get students to think about defining what family is, as well as defining what family communication is. Um, so first I'll note that this reading pairs well with the defining family activity and paper assignment that I'll talk about later in this very session. Second, uh, this reading also serves as a great model for class discussion. Uh, so what this third day of class reading does is exactly as the name implies. It shows Dr. Simons on the third day of class teaching, uh, going through her lesson, and so you get to see students talk about how they define families, some of the pitfalls in that thinking, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, and so what I like to do personally for the undergraduate students is I like to have them go through some activities where they try to define family absent of the readings and not thinking about that. And then I take them into this reading and so they can kind of go through and see how other students are discussing. And so to that point, it serves as a great model for class discussion because they can see how uh, Dr. LeBlanc's students are interacting and discussing in that classroom. And so they can kind of get a sense of, okay, I see the kinds of things you can talk about and how you can theorize about this in the classroom and make challenges or ask questions or so on and so forth. And so I think it serves a good purpose there. And then a third benefit of this reading is that it is highly accessible. Uh, I do not give this to my graduate students, but I do give it to the undergraduate students uh, and they're able to read it and understand it uh, and they actually enjoy it quite a bit. Um, and so that's a nice reading to have in your undergraduate classroom. All right, moving on to another resource that also is authored by Sarah Simons along with other colleagues. Um, lead author Lorraine Olson has written a, has co-written with these uh, scholars a wonderful book called The Dark Side of Family Communication. Um, I will tell you this book is um, textbook-ish and by that I mean uh, they do a really nice job of gathering together a lot of the literature about the dark side of family communication and they contribute lots of new ideas about where that literature can go and do some original theorizing. Uh, and so this book is definitely academic and something that you could use within your research. But at the same time, at the end of every chapter, there are questions or um, other activities that, that indicate that this is something you can give to students and have them use. I've never used this in the undergraduate classroom. Uh, I've had students read it in the graduate classroom. Um, but what I'm about to present to you, I use in a different way. And so rather than looking at the whole book today, I'm going to look at a chapter from that book, um, particularly the chapter called Conceptualizing the Dark Side of Family Communication. And I use this chapter in two ways. Uh, for undergraduates, I think that it's uh, probably maybe a little, a little too dense or they might not be ready for it. So I do not give this particular chapter to undergraduates, but I lecture from this chapter to undergraduates. Um, and I think that, that in some cases, there are a lot of undergraduate students that could handle this. Um, so I'm not saying you necessarily couldn't use it in an undergraduate class. You just have to kind of feel it out and know whether or not you had the right undergraduate class that, that was kind of ready for something like this. Um, but I also use it for doctoral seminars as well. And so let me talk about the two especially helpful features that um, have, have kind of made me want to use it in these different ways. And so first, uh, they offer this beautiful timeline of the different definitions of family. And so you'll remember this session is about defining family. Uh, and one of the neat things that they do is they provide this table on page 22 that is examples of definitions of family across time. And so you can see here they start in 1949 and they go forward. Um, and so it's a wonderful resource to help students know that family, you know, the way we define it changes over time. It's fluid, like we're going to think about it differently. And so that timeline of the different definitions of family, I can pop that into an undergraduate uh, lecture uh, and help them to look at that and think about that, or maybe even do an activity with it. And of course, I give credit to Dr. Olson and her colleagues. Um, or I can give that reading to graduate students. When I give that reading to graduate students, I think it really helps them to think about different family experiences. Um, and so I do teach about the dark side in my family communication class at the undergraduate level. Um, but at the graduate level, they especially like to get into this reading and kind of get past that positivity bias that Steve Duck and others have written about in terms of interpersonal research and think about how families have different kinds of experiences. And rather than trying to fix everything or make it better or worry you know, a lot about satisfaction, sometimes it's worth it to kind of hang out in the dark side and see what's there and to think about how this plays out. And so I think this is a really good reading uh, to help do that. All right, so I have told you about three great readings. I hope they are helpful to you. Now let's move into this session's activity and assignment. And so the first activity uh, is what I call the defining family activity. Again, I am not claiming to have invented this. Um, I use a defining communication activity in the communication theory classroom. This was just a rip on that. I'm sure somebody else has developed this way before I even thought about it. Um, but I did want to share my version with you to kind of let you know 
how I use it and, and what happens in my classroom when we do the, when we do the defining family activity. <clears throat> and so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put your students into pairs or groups. Then you're gonna have each group come up with a different definition of family. Um, I know that in some, some variations, people try to get students to think of a definition for family communication. I start with family because I'm really wanting them to think about the assumptions that we carry with that word. And so if we're gonna dig into communication about families and within families, we need to know both what we're talking about when we talk about families, and then if we're looking in families, who would that be, who would that include, what does that mean? And so I ask each, each group to come up with a definition of family. And then once that definition is constructed, a representative from the group will write the definitions, uh, the group's definition on the board, or however you have to do that. I know some rooms don't have boards. Uh, one thing that I've, I've done in the past is I've opened up a Word document, um, and then I put those different definitions in there and then um, broadcasted them to the class so everybody could see it. And then four, um, each group has a member explain the definition and how it came to be, all right? Pretty simple activity. Um, a lot of where this activity pays off is not just in getting them to think about family and to discuss what family means and who it includes, uh, but to have the debriefing session afterwards. And so the fifth thing that I do is I move into the discussion prompts. And so some of the discussion prompts I use for the defining family communication activity, one, who do you think has the best definition and why? So this gets at the idea of, oh, do you see something you like better? Um, and the important part of that is the why. So what about this definition is more appealing or more fair or more worthy? So you're kind of getting students to talk a little bit about criteria and standards and what they value in terms of a definition. Second, I like to ask who is included and excluded in these definitions? Um, and so I'll pick one or two and I'll say, okay, let's look at this one. Who is included in this definition of family? And honestly, the first time I do it, a lot of people are like, um, I don't know, like a family. Um, but when you get to the excluded part, that's where it's really interesting. And one thing I like to do is I like to get photo prompts to help get students into this. And so I'll put these on the overhead and I'll ask, okay, so is this family included? And then it's not just a matter of figuring out whether this family in the photo is actually in that definition, but you can also get students into a little bit of the, the idea of how they're reading a family or what they assume about a family. Uh, and so at some point in this, I'd say, okay, so let, let's just unpack this picture. What do we see here? Uh, and students almost always say, I see two gay dads and their three adopted children. And so I'll say, okay, how do we know that they're the dads? Uh, and they'll say, well, it looks like they just got married and they have children. I'm like, right, but how do we know one of these uh, fathers didn't already have the children, right? And so I'm, I'm kind of playing there, right, and getting them to say, well, they would still have another dad, right? And so there's, there's that kind of idea going on. Um, but then we can unpack the word adopted. So almost always they'll say these children were adopted. And I'll say, how do we know they were adopted? Uh, and sometimes students will lock up because they're afraid to say, oh, well, you know, uh, it looks like the, the children are of a different race, right? And so you can kind of unpack that and talk about that as well. Um, and even present the idea that, you know, this could be, um, it could be that one of these two men is the biological father, or maybe each man is a biological father to different children. Um, and it could even be that they're not necessarily married. Um, and so maybe they are two cousins playing with, um, some nieces or nephews or something along that line. So, so you can kind of unpack what do we assume and how do we start to read or make sense of a family when we see them. This is another great photo for that. Um, and so I'll show this and a lot of times students will go like, are they family or is that a group of friends? Or are you trying to say that a group of friends can sometimes be family? Which you know leads to great discussion points too. But I could bring up, well, these are cousins, right? And then once you say that they're cousins, um, then all of a sudden like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, and so they're a little more accepting that, that once you get to that cousin idea. And so that's a soft way to start to int introduce the idea of discourse dependence and that some families depend on having a discourse, which we'll talk much more about in the third session. Um, and then the other thing I like to do with this picture is ask, well, you know, I asked you to define the word family. And so were you trying to define family or a family? All right, we'll get back to that, to that in a moment. 
And then I like to show this photo as well. And so uh, one of the nice things about the Golden Girls is a lot of generations know who they are. Uh, and so there will always be students who don't know who the Golden Girls are. I've never had a class be completely ignorant to the Golden Girls. So they are more of an enduring popular culture artifact. But I uh, show this photo of the Golden Girls and then a lot of people go, I don't know if they're family or they'll start to guess that they're sisters or cousins, especially if I've shown another picture that I've told them are sisters or cousins. Um, but inevitably, somebody will, will typically say something to the extent of, well, you know, two of them are family. So the one in the front's a mother and the one in red, or, or the one in the front is a daughter and the one in red is a mother. Uh, and then they just live with the other two. Um, and then what I like to do is I like to show them an episode of the Golden Girls uh, from the second season where it is Christmas time and the girls are trying to fly out of Miami uh, but their plane is canceled and so they go to a restaurant to commiserate together um, and they start teasing each other and joking around but they, they keep talking about how bummed they are that they can't be with their families on Christmas Day and then a man comes over who owns the diner and so he, the proprietor gives them all a piece of cheesecake which if you know the Golden Girls you know they love their cheesecake um, but he gives them their cheesecake and then uh, he said, did I overhear you say that you're not family? He goes, I would have never guessed that. The way you were cutting up and teasing each other, I would have for sure known you were a family. And then all of a sudden, the women look at each other and they start to realize, you know, we aren't missing out on family at all. And in fact, one of them even says that. We have family here, right? We are a family, right? And so this is a great way to, to introduce that notion of chosen family and to kind of get them to think about, well, is that a family? Is that not a family? And by showing them that clip, it really gets them into the idea and so you can unpack that as well. So again, this defining family activity is really a lot of, about the discussion prompts and where you can take it. And as you can imagine, I, I usually start the activity at the beginning of a class period and then it'll run all the way through um, because students start to want to talk. Um, and so again, returning to that idea I introduced um, earlier, I'll ask them, do these definitions that we see on the board, do they define family or a family? And what you'll find is that a lot of the definitions define a family, right? And so they're thinking of um, probably the more stereotypical nuclear unit of family, right? And so you can get into that discussion. Also, I like to ask, do we get to pick or choose some of our family members? And so I'll usually do that in line with the Golden Girls um, clip that I show them. Uh, but also, um, I'll, I'll bring up the idea that, that sometimes, you know, not only do we get to pick and choose, but sometimes we can reject family members uh, and students are really resistant to that idea and you'll see where um, we talk more about that notion of, of the voluntary, na voluntary nature of family in the third session. And then one question I'd like to end with is do we even really need to define family and so why is that important? Uh, from my experience a lot of students adamantly say yes we need to understand what families are. Families are you know the the most important unit of our society or family means a lot to me. Um, but I like to keep going back, but does that mean that we need to define it? So do we have to have a definition for family? And what, what is the purpose of having a definition for family? Um, and so a little more existential there, um, but it kind of gets them in the idea of if, if we can feel it and sense it does, it, does it matter what a definition of family is? Um, yet at the same time, we know there are people that study families. We know that there are programs that benefit families. And so probably practically, we're gonna to have to have a definition, right? So you can get deep into those discussions. All right, so I told you a little bit about uh, the defining family activity and how that works for me. Uh, I often pair that with a defining family paper assignment. And what I do for the defining family paper assignment is uh, I have students each offer a definition of family within the paper. There's no hedging. They can't say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to define family. I make them choose a definition of family and stick to that definition. In that paper, students also have to defend their definition of family, and they are limited to two pages for doing so. Uh, I'll usually allow three for graduate classes. Uh, that two-page two limit can be really helpful. I used to not have the limit, and I'd have some students come with like 10 pages of, of writing, and a lot, you know, it could be reduced down to two. Uh, but then also other students will define it and say, because that's what a family is and go a little circular. If you have two pages, you're at least encouraging, encouraging them to go a bit deeper with what they're thinking about. And then a rule I have for this paper is that students are not allowed to use another source's definition, but they can cite other definitions in defense of their own. 
And so, in other words, they can bring in other literature to help them figure out what a family is and how they're defining it. And then that leads into that, that paper assignment that can lead into or out of the readings about defining family. And so the way I like to do it is have them discuss family as a class and then go write their papers. And then I show them some of those readings about defining family so they can kind of discover it themselves first before they go into the reading about it. But it works the other way as well. I've done it the other way. Um, and your students will still get a lot individually out of this assignment, but they're also going to get a lot from the discussion that you can have when students turn this assignment in. So once students turn in that family paper and, and, and define it, um, I like to ask them a series of questions. And so for this particular paper, I like to start with, was this a hard assignment and why? And almost always they say, yeah, it is hard. And they start to talk about kind of the exigencies that make it difficult not only to define family, but then once you've done that, to make sure that others are included and that it's flexible enough to, to apply to a lot of people. So they start to see that, they start to learn that as they try to do that. Um, and I always love that kind of learning. And then I like to ask, did you try to be inclusive with your definition? And if so, how? And so they talk a little bit about that element. And then I'll segue into a preview or a review of the definition readings. And so if, obviously if I've already had them do the readings, then it'll be a review. Um, but I'll get them into that, into a preview so they can talk about it. And so there's a little unpacking here that can lead to a lot of discussion. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting is once the students have come up with their own definition, sometimes when they go into those readings, they'll be more ready to kind of, you know, stand hard and defend their, their stance, um, or they'll adapt their stance. And so it's really fun for them to, to see them theorizing or, um, via this definition and saying, well, you know, I thought this way, but now I think this way. And now I'm wondering if I should think more that way, right? So you're, you're kind of getting them to go complex, go deep, and to see that even their own ideas about what a family is can change and that scholarship can help us to do that or research studies can help us to do that. And then as I mentioned earlier, uh, this assignment, similar to the uh, assignment where you're, where you're having them discuss and, and present definitions of family in class, can set the stage for discourse dependence. Um, and that idea of, you know, do some families need some extra explanation or do you rely, you know, when we read these families and see these families, do sometimes we have to have more information to understand that they are a family, right? Um, and so this sets the stage nicely for that. All right, so uh, we'll talk more about discourse dependence in session number three, which is thinking about normative and non-normative families. So that's still to come. Um, but coming up next, so, so we're near the end of this session, uh, but after this one, you'll next go on to session number two, which is about identity and difference. Uh, I think the name is pretty obvious. We're going to be looking at identities, not, not only like individual identities of people within families, but larger family identities as well, and how those identities can be different. Um, and so for that session, I'm going to be drawing in this cool new book that is literally hot off the presses, just released, um, that I think you're going to love. And so that's what's coming with session two. Thank you so much for being a part of this first session. I hope you want to come back and get more from sessions two through five. Uh, if you have anything you want to write me, if you think there's something I need to know, if you think there's something I need to add to these resources, please email me at jimmym at unr.edu. I would love to hear from you. And then remember, the readings, uh, overviews of these assignments, and some videos are available along with this video. Um, and, so go and, check, and so go check those out. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this journey. Uh, I hope that you had as much fun as I did. And I'll see you with session number two.